Next example f of x equals one plus x to the negative two power. I'm gonna figure out the Taylor series for this in three different ways and get the same answer each way. It'll be like magic. A mathemagician. So there is somebody who calls himself a mathemagician, so it might be trademarked, but anyway, p equals to two here. So, I mean, we do get a quality of f of x with its Taylor series, it turns out, for x between negative one and one. And it turns out with p equal to two, negative two, we get one plus px would be minus two x because p is negative two. Uh, plus p times p minus one over two factorial times x squared plus p times p minus one times p minus two over three factorial times x cubed, et cetera. Simplify one minus two x. Uh, it's gonna be a plus three x squared, right? The next term there, negative signs go away. There's two of them being multiplied. Two factorials, two, the twos cancel. In the next one, we'll get a minus sign because of the three negatives. The three factorial is six cancels with the two times three. I'm with left with the minus four X cubed. Actually, we saw this example the other day. There's one derivation of its series. Here's another derivation. F of X also equals one over one plus X squared. One squared is one, so I can write this. And when you square a fraction, you square the numerator and denominator. I use that fact in reverse right there. And wait a minute. One over one plus X, we already talked about that series today. It's that one. It's geometric, sum of a geometric series. This is one minus X plus X squared minus X cubed, et cetera, squared. Can I square this infinite series to get the answer? Yes. This is foil on steroids. Well, it's not really foil. I am multiplying two infinite series. How do you do that? Step by step, very carefully. Start with the first term there, one. Multiply it times every term there. That's easy. I get every term over there. Then go to the next term on the left, negative x. Multiply it times every term over there. And where should I put the answer? Over here? You could, but it's more fun and easier to not make a mistake in the end by putting it under this one and matching up like terms vertically. Negative x times one is negative x. Put it under the other negative x. Negative X times negative X is positive X squared. Put it under the other positive X squared. Maybe you see where this is going. Negative X times X squared is negative X cubed. Put it under, under the other negative X cubed. Yeah, it's gonna go down like this and maybe you even see quickly why it equals that. Go to the next term, X squared. X squared times one is X squared. X squared times negative X is negative X cubed. Go to the next term, negative X cubed times one is negative X cubed, et cetera. Yeah, we have an infinite series of infinite series. If we're wondering, do infinite series converge, we should feel really squeamish about this. But blindly assuming everything is fine, Combine the like terms and we do get the right answer. 
Same answer as before. This is the kind of thing you can look it up in their documents that Newton and Leibniz and other people like Euler and Bernoulli brothers and the and like Lagrange and Laplace, they were all doing these kinds of calculations all the time and they never worried about convergence too much. This was like late 1600s through the 1700s. Maybe even Gauss still did this kind of stuff. Gauss was around the turn of the uh, 1800s from 1700s to 1800s. It was only in the mid 1800s with people like Cauchy and Weierstrass and Riemann that people started getting worried. Is this really right? And the precise definition of a limit was developed to try to address questions of whether this is really right or not. It was precipitated actually by a crisis. Fourier precipitated, precipitated a crisis with Fourier series, which is at the end of chapter 10, which we'll talk about briefly, but I won't assign any problems from after the exam. Fourier series are even weirder series and they led to lots of mysterious questions that people didn't know the answer to. And they're like, we need to really understand what's going on here in the mid 1800s. And so that's why the precise definition of a limit involving like epsilon and delta, you remember that from Calc 1, came about was so people could resolve these issues. But anyway, we're sort of blindly doing what Newton, Leibniz, and Euler did, for example. They're, they're great mathematician scientists, but they, they didn't do things completely rigorously. They, they would try different techniques and get the same answer, and they, they would think of that as proof. Okay, But just because you get the, the same answer with both techniques doesn't mean it's a proof. It just helps you believe it. It's not really rigorous. You haven't proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is the right answer. This is also, by the way, for the absolute value of x less than one. Let's do it one more way. What is the derivative of negative one over one plus x? Might seem like a random question, but it's relevant. The derivative of that is, well, take the derivative, one plus x to the negative two. The exact same function we just tried to find the series for and, and found it in fact. Right, that's f of x, p is negative two. It's this. So our function, one plus x to the negative two is the derivative of that function. But that function is the opposite of <laughs> this one that we just squared. So this should be the negative of the derivative of one over one plus X, which will be the negative of the derivative of substitute the series in one minus X plus X squared minus X cubed plus X to the fourth, et cetera. Can I differentiate an infinite series term by term? Yes, at least for values of x in the interior of the interval of convergence between negative one and one in this case. So differentiate that. And then after doing that, multiply everything by negative one and get the exact same answer we got before. Amazing. I found the series for this function in three different ways. With the binomial series formula, p equal to negative two, by squaring the series for one over one plus x, and by differentiating the series for negative one over one plus x. Same answer helps you believe that it's right. And it's fun. It's supposed to be a fun part of class right now. Should be fun. 
If you can differentiate series term by term, can you integrate series term by term? Yes. In fact, I think we already kind of did that once. Let's redo it again. I think pretty much the same example, if I recall. I mean, we did it with natural log. I think we also did it with our tangent last time. Ln of one plus X is the integral of one over one plus X, right? Well, what about the plus C? Don't worry about the plus C, right now at least. If we replace one over one plus X with its series, same one I've been using multiple times today. Can we find the answer for ln of one plus X by integrating term by term? Yes. Here it is. This is the integral of that series going on forever here. What about a plus C? Do I need a plus C? Uh, yeah, but the C will end up being zero in this case. Why? Because if you replace X with zero, on the left side, you get ln of one, which we know is zero. And on the right side, you get zero if you replace all those X's with zero. So C ends up being zero, the plus C from the integral. So we don't have to write it. And this indeed is the series for natural log of one plus X. Though, remember, this is a little funny. The interval is not an open interval. The interval actually contains positive one by the alternating series test. Though again, to prove equality of the series with this function is something we're not really doing here. I mean, it seems reasonable based on this calculation that it should be true, but we're not really doing that rigorously. Okay, so yes, you can also integrate term by term. We need more examples. What's the series of our favorite function? What's your favorite function? It should be e to the x. That should be your favorite function. Uh, for one thing, its derivatives are all itself. That's one big reason why e to the x is many people's favorite function. And so if we try to find the Taylor series for e to the x centered at a equals zero, we keep computing e to the zero, which is one. F of zero is one, F prime of zero is one, F double prime of zero is one, F triple prime of zero is one. We keep getting a bunch of ones. And it turns out that this function F of X equals E to the X does equal its Taylor series, P infinity of X. And that Taylor series turns out to be one plus one times X plus one over two factorial times X squared, plus one over three factorial times X cubed, et cetera, forever and ever, which is most commonly written as one plus X plus X squared over two factorial plus X cubed over three factorial, et cetera. For what values of X does this converge? If I wrote this in summation notation, say using k as my index of summation, here's the way you would write it. And this is consistent, including at k equals zero because zero factorial is one and x to the zero power is one, ignoring the fact that technically zero to the zero power is undefined, just ignore that fact. That would be the summation form of the series. This would be my a k, my kth term, if I try to use the ratio test to figure out for what values of X this series converges, what's gonna happen? I'm gonna skip a little a step or two here and just say that I will get this over K plus one factorial times K factorial over this. The absolute value of X to the K's cancel k plus one factorial is k plus one 
times k factorial, so the k factorials cancel. And I'm left with the absolute value of x over k plus one. What do we do now with the ratio test? We let k go to infinity, or if it were an n, we'd let n go to infinity. What does this approach, if anything, as k goes to infinity? What do you think? Look at it. What if x is 10? It'd be 10 over k plus one. What does that approach? Come on, somebody must know. Zero. If x was a Google or a Googleplex, a Googleplex over k plus one, still approaches zero. Doesn't matter how big x is. When you do this ratio test calculation, you think of x as fixed. That's k that's changing here. This goes to zero, which is less than one, no matter what x is. Therefore, the series converges for all x. For all x, the interval of convergence, interval of convergence is the entire real number line. Sometimes written like that, sometimes written like that. That kind of R represents all real numbers. And the radius of convergence, which unfortunately gets just a plain old R, is infinite. I'm not saying infinity is a number here, okay? It's just shorthand notation to say all real numbers there and infinite interval here, meaning all real numbers is the interval of convergence. Either way you look at it, the interval of convergence is all real numbers. That's convergence of the series, but that doesn't prove that it actually equals e to the x. We need something else to prove that it actually equals e to the x. That's next week after the exam. Exam on Monday, we'll talk about that on Wednesday. Why does it actually equal e to the x? I mean, it seems reasonable. I mean, we're matching up all the derivatives at zero. Why shouldn't it equal e to the x? Well, if you think about it a little harder, that's, you're only matching up the derivative values at one point. Why should that make the functions equal everywhere? It's really because e to the x is a very, very special function. That's really why. Let's do it for sine and cosine. f of x equals sine. The derivatives, again, have a pattern. Not quite as simple as e to the x, but still a pattern. The derivative is cosine. The second derivative is negative sine of x. The third derivative is negative cosine of x. The fourth derivative is back to sine. Sine and cosine have the property that their fourth derivatives always equal themselves. Amazing. The pattern continues. We can then plug in a equals zero. Sine of zero is zero. Cosine of zero is one. All the even derivative values at zero are zero. All the odd derivative values are either one or negative one. So there's still a pattern. Zero, one, zero, negative one, zero, one, zero, negative one, zero, one, zero, negative one, forever and ever. And it does turn out that sine of x that's the f of x, does equal p infinity of x. It does equal its Taylor series centered at zero for all x actually. f of zero is zero, so I could write this as zero plus one times x, the one coming from there, plus zero over two factorial times x squared, minus, 1 over 3 factorial times x cubed plus 0 over 4 factorial times x to the fourth. The 0 there would come from that, etc. All the even powers would go away, leaving you only with odd powers alternating in sign. No pun intended. All odd powers, wait a minute, isn't sine an odd function? Yes, it is. How have we emphasized that sine is an odd function before? If you graph it, the graph has origin symmetry, 
take any part of the graph and reflect it across the origin, you get another point in the graph. Alternatively, on the unit circle, start over at the point one zero. If X is positive, go counterclockwise, distance X, or arc length X, radian angle X is another way to say that. Sine is the second coordinate up there. Sine of negative X would be the opposite of that across the X axis. Sine of negative X is Sine of negative X is negative sine of X. Here with series, we see it's odd because we have only odd powers in the series expansion. This is true for all X. The interval of convergence is all real numbers and it equals the sine function for all real numbers. By the way, some people are so enamored with this stuff that they take these series like this one for e to the x and this one for sine, and they take them to be the definition of e to the x and sine of x. They take these equations to be true by definition. What way you approach it is a matter of style in a sense. If you take these definitions, then you have to use these things to prove other things. Actually, we've never rigorously proved the definitions of e to the x and sine of x and cosine of x. We just think about them intuitively geometrically with sine and cosine and graphically with e to the x. We've never really said what e to the pi power means, for example. I should also emphasize, by the way, that you can use this to figure out a series for e itself. Just replace all the x's with one and you get an infinite sum that equals e. I'll give you a few homework problems like that. You can plug in any value of x that you want. You can also get a series for e squared, e to any power, a particular numerical series. And you can do the same kind of thing with the sine and the cosine. And what is the series for cosine? Cosine is, well, it's the derivative of sine. Use that fact. Differentiate that series term by term. The derivative of x is one. The derivative of minus x cubed over three factorial, bring down the three. Three divided by three factorial is one half, which is also one over two factorial. Also subtract one from that exponent to get x squared. Derivative of this one, bring down the five. Five over five factorial is, cancel the fives, one over four factorial. Subtract one from the exponent, you get x to the fourth over four factorial. This pattern continues as well. And notice that's in all even powers. It's not an accident. Cosine's an even function. Its graph has symmetry about the y-axis. Thinking about the unit circle, first coordinate of the stopping point is the same as cos for cosine of negative x and cosine of x. They're on the same vertical line. Cosine of negative x equals cosine of x for all x. And this is true for all x as well. 